Tonight on Greater Boston, Reverend Cornell William Brooks joins me on why he and 24 other faith leaders are on a hunger strike as part of what he says is the war on democracy that began on January 6th, and he means war quite literally. He'll explain ahead. And later, a new investigation into one of the corrupt officers whose testimony helped send at least two men to prison for murders they did not commit. I'm joined by the attorney for Sean Ellis, one of those men, Rosemary Scapiccio. And finally, the creator of Faces of COVID, Alex Goldstein, on the flood of racist and anti-Semitic trolls trying to make a mockery of his effort to honor the lives of those lost to the pandemic, an effort he's not giving up so easily. Many have noted that Joe Biden's address last Thursday, marking the one-year anniversary of the Capitol attack, was the starkest and most powerful speech he's given. The former president of the United States of America has created and spread a web of lies. This was an armed insurrection. But my next guest sees January 6th as something more, an act of war. That's according to former NAACP president and CEO Cornell William Brooks, who recently told The Emancipator, that's a publication by The Globe and BU, that, quote, this was literally a violent declaration of intent under the orders of the president with the aid and abetting by members of Congress. The notable difference between this and the Civil War is they haven't gotten around to designating uniforms yet. Brooks is part of 25 faith leaders from across the country who began a hunger strike on last Thursday's anniversary to urge passage of voting rights protection legislation. Reverend Cornell Williams Brooks joins me now. He's the founding director of the Trotter Collaborative for Social Justice, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government Center for Public Leadership, as well as professor at that school. Reverend, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for your time. Good to see you. You started this on uh, January 6th. The intent is to continue it through the day that Chuck Schumer said there'll be a vote, which not coincidentally is Martin Luther King uh, Day. What is it that you hope to achieve in those 11 days? In those 11 days between the anniversary of an American tragedy, that is to say the insurrection, and the anniversary of a prophet of hope, that is to say the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, between those days, we have 11 days to go without food, um, to uh, purify ourselves, and to lift up the imperiled state of the right to vote. Let's bear this in mind. Martin Luther King, whom, whose life we will celebrate and honor, uh, risked his life again and again for the right to vote. John Lewis, who we honored so uh, uh, only shortly ago, he risked his life again and again for the, life, for the right to vote. A few years ago, Jim, I, I walked, marched with the NAACP from Selma to Washington, D.C., a thousand miles. So here we are in this moment, subject to uh, a violent insurrection, the right to vote being suppressed from one end of the country to the other, and we're using our bodies to demonstrate the imperiled state of democracy and the necessity to pass voting rights legislation. Uh, I, I'm almost embarrassed to move from the near spiritual to the mundane, but do you expect yes. the senators, Manchin, Cinema, and 50 Republicans to be moved? Uh, here's what I expect. What I expect is the American public to be moved. I'm far more confident in the people who took to the streets by the millions in the George Floyd protests, the climate change, protests, so I'm confident in them. And bear this in mind, in 1965, there was a filibuster then. Uh, there was opposition to voting rights then. We secured the Voting Rights Act. So my confidence is in the American public, and my confidence is that we can apply enough pressure to get the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act out of Congress, uh, as well as the For the People Act. But uh, with all due respect to Joe Biden, uh Joe Biden is no Lyndon Johnson. And I'm not suggesting that people didn't rise up, but Johnson was a very special kind of president in terms of his ability to, let's call it, manipulate votes in the Congress. This may be true, but this is also true. If we can get the, need, the needed changes with respect to the filibuster, what we need to pass uh, voting rights legislation, the bar is lowered. Let's note this. Biden has 
President Biden has to speak to the circumstances. He has to speak to the moment that we're in. Leaders are formed of their own volition, but they're also formed by the circumstances, the history uh, that they inherit. And so in this moment, he has no other choice. We have no other choice. We should make clear, I should have made clear that both the president and the vice president are speaking in Georgia tomorrow on this very right. same subject. So I mentioned uh, war and your thoughts. You compared January 6th to the first shots being fired at the Civil War at Fort Sumter. Could you flesh that out a little bit for me? Absolutely. So I grew up 60 miles from Fort Sumter where the first shots were fired uh, in the Civil War, in which Fort Sumter was taken over before there was the Confederate Army. It was a military declaration of intent, a violent declaration of intent. In Washington, D.C., a year ago with the insurrection, we had the president call for American citizens to come, to take over the watch, to take over the Capitol, to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. It was a violent declaration of intent. Subsequent to that, we have seen again and again in state legislatures across the country voter suppression yeah. laws, and we have seen again and again across the country disinformation campaigns. Now, the war is being carried out, not with cannons, not with old-fashioned muskets or rifles. It's being carried out by suppressing votes. It's being carried out with disinformation. It's being carried out by dividing American against American. It is, in fact, a war. Let's stay with the war notion for a minute. You used to work at the Department of Justice. How do you feel the Department of Justice is fighting that war? The Department of Justice is, is prosecuting cases in the way the Department of Justice prosecutes cases, which is to say, conservatively speaking, not ideologically, but prosecuting cases to the extent that they can prove the charges. The problem here is... We, we don't have a series of disconnected minor crimes of, of trespass uh, and, and disorderly conduct. These are political crimes akin to treason and sedition. So I understand that the federal prosecutors are simply trying to make the case. But note this. Note this. The majority of people have been charged with, in fact, uh, misdemeanors. And they have been given sentences less than what the prosecutors have asked for. So the charges and the punishment do not measure up to the magnitude of the crime. So in other words, what other, what other country in the world could you have essentially a threat to our nation's capital, right? That, that's the home of our democracy. And uh, when you get away with uh, a misdemeanor charge. I've taken over federal buildings. I've protested and demonstrated. But we didn't threaten people's lives. We didn't beat up police officers. We didn't try to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. Yeah, but even if uh, there were adequate uh, uh, sentences and adequate prosecutions against the troops, for lack of a better expression, the generals, mm -hmm. we don't even know if the generals are being investigated, much less charged. Is that not correct? We don't know that. But we should know that, and they should be investigated. Certainly in the in Congress, there's a wide speaking, wide uh, widespread investigation, yeah. but we, got, we need to look all the way up. It's not enough to look at the, uh, the privates and corporals without looking at the, the generals and, and colonels. You know, when I was reading uh, the press release uh, issued by you and your 24 fellow faith leaders today, I was sort of embarrassed about all the rhetoric that I spout about the importance of voting rights protection and how little I and a lot of people like me have done. We are part of the problem, are, are, are we not? Not so much part of the problem, you're part of the solution, right? Which is to say, every time you cast a ballot, you are participating in a civic sacrament, important. But it's important in this moment for Americans to also demonstrate, to protest, to yes, call members of Congress. But we gotta be very clear about this. When the other side is engaged in disinformation, when the other side is engaged in suppressing vote, when the other side is literally dividing us one against the other, waiting, voting every year, every two years, or every four years is necessary, but not sufficient. And so we are all part of a solution, which is to say we have to do a whole lot more. Before you go, if I miss lunch, I am complaining. How are you feeling four days into this with another week to go? Um, just an ongoing headache. This ongoing headache and uh, uh, water with lemon uh, can 
help with the nausea, but, but the headaches are, uh, are tough. I wish you an end to headaches, and I admire your strength, and I wish you luck in your effort. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thank you. It's good to see you. When a judge finally cleared Sean Ellis of a remaining wrongful gun conviction last May, it was the end of a decades-long struggle for a man who'd spent 22 years in prison for a murder he did not commit, thanks to a group of corrupt Boston cops. But they're not the only dirty cops, and Ellis is not their only victim. Ellis's attorney, Rosemary Scapiccio, joined me last spring after Suffolk County DA Rachel Rollins, now U.S. attorney, called out the misconduct by the police department and the then DA's office, and then officially ended the prosecution of her client. And despite that victory, Scapiccio was calling for far more. It's the first time in 28 years that the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office uh, acknowledged that there was massive corruption in the Boston Police Department in the, uh, in the 90s. Uh, in, in the 2000s, and, and it needs to be addressed. And we're hopeful that now that this acknowledgement has been made uh, and filed with the court, that, that there will be some um, institution that looks into uh, the any conviction that included Sarah Robinson, Brazel, Mulligan, or Detective Keeler. And so they are. Sean Ellis was famously profiled in Netflix docuseries Trial 4, but for those few who don't know his case, he was 19 when he was arrested in 93 and tried for the murder of Boston police detective John Mulligan, who was shot five times in the face and killed following a robbery. Ellis was eventually convicted of murder and first-degree robbery, sentenced to life without parole. But then in 1998, two Boston police detectives, pivotal to the case, pled guilty to corruption charges, and a third got immunity in exchange for testifying against the other two. Now, more than two decades later, that third detective, John Brazil, currently enjoying a $45,000 police pension, I should say, is under investigation as well for his role in both Ellis's false conviction and that of another man, James Lucian, who was released last month after 27 years in prison. In one of her last moves in office as DA, Rachel Rollins last week launched that investigation. I'm joined now by Sean Ellis's attorney, Rosemary Scapiccio. Scapiccio. Rosemary, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Jim. How significant is what Rachel Rollins did? Uh, I think it's, it's a giant step forward in terms of holding um, bad police officers accountable. This is what we asked for after the Drumgold verdict. It's what we asked for after the Ellis verdict. Uh, it's what should be done any time that a determination is made that a police officer lied during the course of a homicide investigation. How do we trust what that officer said in other cases if, if we don't do the investigation and find out what, you know, what caused him to lie, what allowed him to lie so freely um, so that he didn't feel like he would ever get caught? But are we ever going to have an opportunity to see how expansive his lies were? My understanding from having read a Boston Globe story is the police department is fighting an effort to have his disciplinary file released, which I assume would give us some indication if Lucian and Ellis were everything or if there's much more. Well, I don't know that everything would be in the disciplinary file, Jim. I think that uh, the disciplinary file is, is basically for um, the police to investigate um, either wrongful acts of uh, breaking the rules or criminal activity. I don't know that they ever opened a file on Brazil. I've never seen it, if it exists. My Paul, I've been calling him Brazil. I didn't know it was pronounced Brazil. So how do we get beyond these two men's cases if there is beyond to be gotten? Well, I think what Rachel Rollins has done is taken a step in the right direction. I think she has acknowledged that Brazil not only lied and, and corrupted the Ellis investigation, but at the same time, nine months later, was assigned to the Lucent investigation and lied and, and hid evidence and, and had some theft going on in that case. I mean, what Judge Ullman said about Detective Brazel is that the case, that Lucent case, got overturned because he committed perjury at a murder trial. That's a pretty significant um, claim to, to, to lodge against a police department. If, if there was someone legitimate running that police department right now, don't you think they would say, wait a minute, a, a Superior Court judge has said that one of our police officers committed perjury. Let's start our own investigation into what's happening. But that's not it. It's, it's business as usual at BPD. It's let's stop the investigation. Let's not look into what happened. And let's keep our eyes forward and, and, and look on the future. And that's not going to teach us anything. We keep repeating these same mistakes over and over again that then many, many, many more Sean Ellis's 
and, and uh, Lucens are going to be locked up. Yeah, let me alive. read specifically what Judge Ullman said when, when he was speaking to the murder victim, Ryan Edwards' family, who was unhappy about the fact that uh, uh, Lucien was being freed. And ex what he said verbatim was, the person to blame is the lead detective in this case, Detective John Brazel. If he had been honest and had done his job correctly, uh, we would not, uh, would not be here. Can you spend 30 seconds and tell people, I should have said this earlier on, exactly what Brazel did in Sean Ellis's case that led to this investigation? In Sean Ellis's case, Brazel lied um, and, and covered up his um, corruption with a Sarah Robinson and Mulligan, where for a period of about nine years from 1990 to 1996, they were ripping off drug dealers in the Boston area. They were keeping the money for themselves and they were putting the drugs back on the street. And they were lying about it because um, what happened when Mulligan got killed is that the defense attorneys at the time believed it had something to do with Mulligan being corrupt, but no one ever told them that there was this investigation open. No one ever said that there was this corruption happening. And, and Brazel hit it forever. And then when he finally got caught, um, what he did instead of taking responsibility is he turned um, and testified against a Sarah and Robinson. So he's never, ever spent a day in jail for what he did in the Ellis case. Well, he is also was granted immunity for that testimony. Does that in any does that in any way I believe that was in a federal proceeding. Was it am I right about that? Does that in yes. any way preclude criminal charges or does the statute of limitations preclude criminal a, charges in this investigation? There's a seven year statute of limitations uh, on perjury cases unless there is an ongoing criminal conspiracy to cover it up. Um, and I don't know if the DA's office has enough to suggest that there's an ongoing criminal conspiracy. But, you know, what, what we should, you know, all stay, step back and pause right now is that Rachel Rollins, even though she left and she went to the U.S. Attorney's Office, you know, she fired this shot across the bow doing the absolute right thing, saying the buck stops here. Not only now do we have these two cases that are overturned because of Brazel's lies, but we have a judge saying he committed perjury in a homicide case. What are we going to do about that? And what she said she wants to do is she wants that office to continue to investigate every case that Brazel was involved in uh, to determine if there are other people that are sitting in jail right now for crimes they didn't commit because we can't trust what Brazel says. But by the way, that division that she created, the Integrity Review Board Bureau, which has done these investigations, its future and the Brazel investigation is now in the hands of Kevin Hayden, who's the interim DA until next year's election. Is there any indication either way as to how his, what his predilection is here, what his intention is? I have not spoken to him, so I don't know directly. Uh, I'm hopeful that, that all of the work that the Conviction Integrity Unit has done uh, with David Lewis at its, at its helm uh, will continue because it's freed a lot of people. It's opened the door to people who were wrongfully convicted. And that was, you know, by Rachel Rollins doing and by David Lewis's investigation. So this wasn't just a situation where someone rang a bell and said, we don't think that they got a fair trial. That Conviction Integrity Unit looked at everything. They looked at transfer, transfers, they interviewed witnesses. They did everything they were supposed to do before they came to the conclusion that these individuals didn't get a fair trial. And when you see, keep seeing the same names coming up over and over again on these, on these motions for a new trial, at some point you have to stop and say, what is going on here? How are they getting away with it? And why are we continuing to believe them in the cases that have led to convictions? You just said you know, there are a number of cases. The Globe reported that there were nine uh, people released who had spent at least 20 years in jail as a result of police or prosecutorial misconduct. Virtually all of the nine men were black. Uh, uh, and uh, is there any indication or should there be an indication that this is just the opening salvo, meaning if it turns out that Brazel is being investigated for his misbehavior, his misconduct here, his criminal misconduct potentially, is there any reason there shouldn't be cops or prosecutors investigated in these other cases as well? In my opinion, absolutely not. It should be open to a full investigation, just like well, I've said before, when, there is a, when there's a plane that crashes, the NTSB comes in, they find the black box, they do an investigation, and they do it so that they can maintain the integrity of the airlines. Why aren't we looking to maintain the integrity of the criminal justice system? Why aren't we looking at the Boston police and saying, there was a problem here, and it's repeating itself over and over and over again. And we should not leave it to these defense attorneys and these, and these defendants to pick these, these cases off one at a time. 
we should, as, as an institution, be investigating any cases that these cops were involved in to determine whether or not their lies contributed to other wrongful convictions. Well, hopefully uh, her interim successor, Mr. Hayden, and the mayor agree with what you just said. Rosemary Scapiccio, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Around five and a half million people worldwide have died of COVID since the pandemic began nearly two years ago. More than 830,000 of those have died here in the U.S., more than any other nation, with around 1,500 dying every day right now. And yet somehow, far fewer people are paying attention. One exception from the start has been Alex Goldstein. Since March of 2020, his Faces of COVID Twitter account has been sharing the names, pictures, and memories of many of those we've lost from across the nation. Like Lowell's own Alex Chiguan, whose family will miss her smile, sense of humor, stubbornness, and willingness to fight. 62-year-old Alonzo Eldridge of Syracuse, who had a big personality, a deep love for his family, unmatched resiliency, and a passion for sports. 47-year-old Andrew Jenkins from Allentown, Pennsylvania, whose witty and whimsical sense of humor will forever have friends and family laughing. And 78-year-old Jimmy Fleming, he from, was from Manchester, New Hampshire, whose family says he was their own superhero. Just a few of the many names and faces which appear on that Twitter account each day in an effort to remind us of the real people behind those unimaginable numbers. But in recent days, that effort, like so many others in the COVID battle, has been targeted by hateful trolls. Here to talk about them and whether he will carry on is Alex Goldstein. Alex, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks again for having me on. I appreciate it. Can you explain to people why you started this thing in March of 2020? Yeah, I think, um, you know, like a lot of folks, I was really having difficulty processing what was happening around me and felt like we needed a space uh, both to affirm the basic dignity of the lives of the people that we were losing so that they were more than just simply a statistic, uh, and also a space to create some accountability for our epic policy failures that have now led to a number of people lost that I don't think either of us could have imagined the first time I came on to talk about this back uh, in 2020. And also, needless to say, in those times, and to an extent now, we weren't able to go through the traditional mourning things that we go through for those whom we love. And I found this to be a wonderful, uh, I wouldn't say replacement, but a piece of, uh, uh, of that. What kind of reaction, I'm sure we could all guess, what, what kind of reaction did you get through those first year plus from not just the people whose loved one you were honoring, but from people in general who had lost someone to COVID? Well, let's start with those folks whose loved ones uh, are lost. I think you just really hit in a really important point, which is uh, with the lack of communal space to grieve, the wakes, the funerals um, that would have normally had the community come together and say goodbye, the digital space uh, to some extent becomes all we have, um, especially when we're grieving in a communal sense uh, for strangers that we never knew. And um, what I heard time and time again from folks was that even having a stranger say in a reply, I'm so sorry for your loss, I didn't know them, but they meant something and I'm sorry, um, actually was impactful. And then I think for everybody else, it was a place to express that grief. We're all holding yeah. it, we're all experiencing, we're, we're watching it happen around us. And to have a space where we can actually show a bit of compassion uh, and care for our neighbors uh, is actually, I think, cathartic for us and meaningful for us as well. Well, and I should say, and meaningful for you, I know you did it on your way to bed and then when you woke up the next day, and for those who don't know, by day you work for governors and mayors and you're a fairly busy uh, guy. So when did these, problems start and can you describe them a bit if you would sure i mean throughout the pandemic people have been overwhelmingly compassionate in response to the stories shared on the feed and uh, sort of inexplicably in the last couple of days uh, there's been a pretty major influx uh, on the submission form that we use to collect these stories where families can submit their loved ones um, there's been a whole bunch of uh, posts coming in that are um, at best, kind of just bogus fakes meant to misdirect and disrupt, uh, and at worst, some pretty uh, aggressively anti-Semitic and racist uh, content as well. So it's been uh, a little bit uh, disturbing, but you know, to some extent, Jim, I feel like whenever you have a growing uh, and visible social media presence that covers really challenging issues, it's unfortunately become par 
for the course um, to get a certain level of abuse and toxicity. And to some extent, I've been surprised at how little we've received up until now. And so unfortunately, I can't say I'm really surprised. So why now? Why, why, why now do you think? I mean, it doesn't surprise me either. It surprises me, as you tweeted and just said, that it took so long, considering everything is a war around COVID. Why, why now? Uh, I have a feeling that it's mostly because a group of trolls finally realized this project was out there and it was ripe for disruption. Um, you know, I don't think it helps uh, from the anti-Semitism lens that I'm pretty publicly and unabashedly a Jewish guy, a progressive guy from Boston that, um, you know, devotes a lot of energy and takes this really seriously. That makes a pretty easy target. But, you know, I, I think that the what I'm trying to do is really um, split the balance between addressing this issue, but also realizing that there are, even today, like right before I came on, I received a message from somebody saying, I saw that the form is disrupted. I want to share my loved one's story. And so people are still finding ways to share those. And that's what I want the focus to be. I don't want to give these folks a platform because I'm sure this is exactly what they're looking for. You know, for those who haven't been there yet, I, I, the only thing I can analogize this to is after 9-11, the brilliant work the New York Times did with those small photos and bios on thousands and thousands of people. And you really, you know, we know how these people died, uh, but we don't know anything about how they lived. And you share that with us, which I think is a huge thing for everybody. Before you go, are you changing anything or is it full speed ahead and you don't like it, but it's, what's the deal? Uh, so right now, folks can still submit stories by reaching out directly to me. My you know messages are open, and hopefully that doesn't become a new receptacle for abuse. You know the the form that we have does ask for citations where people can uh, place obituaries to you know show to yeah. back up the, the submission. But you know at the same time. I'm not really interested in making people prove it. I'm just going to have to keep my eye on it, but I'm not stopping and I'm not going to give these folks the satisfaction of knowing that they were able to disrupt the space because this space is meaningful. And unfortunately, two years into this pandemic, it's pretty clear that we have a long way to go and there's going to be a lot more stories to tell. And I think ultimately this is about telling the history of this pandemic accurately. And uh, I'm not going to let somebody derail that just uh, because it's fun for them to mess with people online. So. I'm glad to hear it, and you've done it beautifully, and I'm really glad you're going to keep at it. Alex, it's good to see you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Jim. Appreciate it. That's it for tonight. Please come back tomorrow. Boston Public Schools Superintendent Brenda Casillas on trying to keep kids in classrooms amid a COVID surge that has hundreds of teachers and staff calling out. That more tomorrow at 7. Thank you for watching, and please stay safe.